Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are here right now with uh, Jonathan Stripley. He is uh, the president of International Council of Design. He is a design leader, design director, mentor, and uh, overall an advocate for change in the creative industries and uh, applying uh, the principles of design in bringing about a change in our environment and making sure uh, we are going in the right direction. So. Uh, over to you, uh, Jonathan. So please uh, walk us through. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Pradyum. I really appreciate that. Uh, it's truly a pleasure for me to be able to participate in this event today, and especially to be able to hear from the contributions of the other speakers. My thanks go to Gideon and his team for leading this conference and for the invitation to share here today. Uh, as Pradyumna had introduced myself. I'm Jonathan Strebley, the president of the International Council of Design, and it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to introduce our organization, but also the impact of design on us as organizations and we on design and the impact through our public through the organizations and the professionals that you are as designers. So a little background, a little history, and then a little talk about what we can be doing to be making a difference. The International Council of Design was established almost 60 years ago and represents more national professional designer associations than any other organization and also counts among its members design education institutions and design promotion entities. Therefore, our focus on design very much represents the perspective of practicing professionals. We were founded in the 60s by European National Professional Designer Associations. With time, members from North America and the early Asian Tigers, Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea joined. But in recent years, we have become really international, reflecting the rising influence of the Asian economies, the South and truly a global economy. We have been particularly involved with the rapid development of the Chinese designer economy. China now is the home of more ECOD members than any other country. These global influences have deeply and fundamentally affected ECOD's structure, perspectives, and agendas, making us more diverse and more attentive to the social obligations of designing. Of course, many African nations are another example of an awakened giant design economy. We are very aware of the need for ECOD to greatly enhance our involvement in Africa and its many vibrant designer communities. And for those reasons, I'm very happy to be here today, hoping to generate new friendships and collaborations while also saying hello to some old friends. Design that challenges the status quo is a fantastic topic for this conference and invites great latitude in how it can be defined. I'm going to take advantage of that opportunity to present ECODI's particular perspective on the challenges and opportunities facing today's designers. So please bear with me while I challenge some basic terms and present a particular view on the very long history of designs and the very short history of designing. I want to discuss and to challenge with status quo descriptions of the relationships between design and technology, design and innovation, and design and industrialization. But let's start by challenging the theme. Design challenges status quo is now a headline and a call to action. So let's get started. The terms design, designing, designs, and designers are widely misunderstood by industry, by consumers, by government, and by the public. Unfortunately, practicing designers, including design educators, often are quite careless and ineffective in the ways they themselves convey the meaning of these terms. If we designers ourselves poorly communicate the meanings of these terms, we can't complain that others do not understand design. As I mentioned at ECOD, we look at designing through the lens of professional designers. We look at the practice of designing in historical terms over the continuum of human history, a human history that goes back 250,000 years. What differentiates humans, Homo sapiens, from other species, and what has enabled humans to become this planet's dominant species, is the capacity to consciously impose their intentions on their surroundings. 
This application of intent is an accurate definition of designing. Homo sapiens, for many reasons, physiological, anthropological, and sociological, differed from other creatures in the ability to create useful tools and artifacts and to contend with and manipulate their physical environments in ways that permitted human societies to develop rapidly. Homo sapiens developed as hunter-gatherers over these 250,000 years. The advances made during that period in terms of tools, weapons, artifacts, material handling, clothing, the ability to travel great distances over land and water, to deal with climate pressures, and including early expressions of art, music, and religion. These represent amazing technological advances and innovations. Technology and innovation are not new, and it is provincial for us to think of them as modern. In fact, one can say that the defining attributes of those seemingly primitive Homo sapiens are that they were innovative, and even more that the defining attribute of humans is that they design. Humans, if anything, are designers. Now, I'm not saying that these people were designing in the current sense of the process. That would come much later. But the history of human beings is a history of their designs, artifacts increasingly sophisticated, devised by humans to improve living conditions. 10,000 years ago, nomadic hunter-gatherer culture around the globe quickly transformed into a new social format based on permanent settlements developing agriculture and domesticated animals. The agricultural revolution. Technological development and innovation accelerated. Villages and towns saw the development of trade and served as centers that fostered the congregation of craftsmen. This was a period of fantastic innovation by any measure. Writing enabled recorded history and administration. Numbers, standard weights, and money enabled commerce and fostered far-flung trading routes. Concepts of laws enabled government and frameworks for social order. In terms of artifacts, craftsmen fashioned ever more sophisticated designs, utilizing rapid advances in material handling. Again, this was not designing in current terms, but these were designs of amazing utility and often of great aesthetic value. The seeds of future industrialization and the future process of designing were being sown. Over the centuries, the needs of powerful leaders, the increasing capacity of craftsmen and opportunities provided by towns grown into cities resulted in two key developments. Craftsmen and material handlers became increasingly specialized introducing differentiation of expertise. At the same time, demand for the serial production of certain artifacts led to the evolution of production lines. Manned by specialized workers making modular components, these were the precursors of industrialization and very importantly for our discussion, among the specialists were the experts who planned the processes. One can call this the first abstract conscious designing process. A very early example of these critical innovations in designing and production lines is the famous terracotta army unearthed in Xi'an, China, dated 221 BC that featured mass production using a series of modular parts, each step of production carried out by different specialist craftsmen Henry Ford did not invent the assembly line. Movable type was used in China in 1045, centuries before Gutenberg. In the year 600, in the city of Tietoacan, a huge metropolis of 200,000 near today's Mexico City, at the time one of the largest cities in the world, pottery used for ritual purposes was produced serially using molds again requiring a specialized abstract designing process. At the end of the 15th century, 30 to 35,000 different books were being issued in Europe, totaling 10 to 20 million copies. Again, this required specialized division of labor and a conscious designing process. In 16th century Venice, 
16,000 workers worked on an assembly line that featured 100 ships being built at the same time, completed at the rate of one a day. Specialized laborers use standardized interchangeable parts in a moving assembly line, a process that could not happen without sophisticated designing processes and expertise. These were the seeds for modern designing, but not recognized as such even today. It is very important to note that these developments occurred independently in different parts of the world. Just as the tendency to generate designs is a universal human attribute, so the seeds for modern designing were sown around the world and certainly are not the provenance of any particular region. To be clear, designing is not Western and never has been. Today's popular concepts of designing are rooted in what we call the Industrial Revolution that broke out in Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries. <clears throat> there are circumstantial, historical, and cultural reasons that explain why the Industrial Revolution occurred in Great Britain, but they are just that, circumstantial. There is nothing inherently national in designing. But it was to Great Britain's great good fortune that local circumstance permitted industrialization to flourish <clears throat> on that small island. A critical mass of knowledge and innovation in material management and power generation, fertilized by a commercial and social culture that encouraged entrepreneurship, led to the first machinery-based factories powered by the newly harnessed energies realized from water, coal, and steam. For the first time, production in large numbers of relatively low cost products became possible. Agricultural workers flocked to the factories located at metropolitan transportation hubs, creating the first examples of urban squalor. Dickens described the crowded, unhealthy conditions and degradation of the air and water. Issues of environmental sustainability caused by industrialization and consumption are also not new. These capacities for production presented great challenges for factory owners. How could the potential of new technologies be utilized for profit? Sound familiar? Hello, Facebook. Hello, Google. Hello, Amazon. Factory owners turn to traditional craftsmen who work with metal and wood to devise new products that could be produced by the new technologies. These were the first modern product designers. The challenge facing producers was not only to how to utilize the new technologies, but to try to ascertain what the newly developing urban middle class would purchase. And how were these products to be merchandised? Factory owners turn to other traditional craftsmen printers and calligraphers to devise packaging and advertisements to market the new products, as well as introduce corporate identities to differentiate between producers. These were the first graphic designers. England in the 19th century was fertile ground for the development of a consumption-based economy. Designers served producers who focused on increasing consumption without regard to social, cultural and environmental impacts. The growing industrial might of Great Britain enabled it to secure its position as the world's most powerful colonial empire, dominating far-flung territories, peoples, and ancient cultures, imposing her economic system on all. Designers obediently served producers, reflecting the Victorian social class system. But in hindsight, something very interesting was happening, unnoticed and very relevant today. Product and graphic designers charged by producers to increase consumption, tried to divine the desires of the new mass consumption class, trying to ascertain what they could be convinced to purchase. But in fact, these designers were not only anticipating what consumers might want, Unconsciously, these early designers themselves were actually determining popular concepts of desire, happiness, and prosperity, and creating social stereotypes. Consider the implications. 
while ostensibly devising physical products and visual messages in service of producers, designers were actually unconsciously determining social and cultural standards. And they continue to do so unconsciously to this day. Individual designers spend their days focused on material artifacts, visual messages, spatial environments, and virtual experiences. But collectively, they are unconsciously fashioning abstract human culture and behavior. That is an amazing idea that describes awesome power and influence, especially because that consumption culture and economic model reflecting 19th century Victorian England very quickly became the dominant global economic model to this day implemented around the world. More than a culture or economic system, unbridled consumption without consideration for the social, cultural, and environmental implications has become a religion. A huge interconnected global machine has evolved, promoting consumption, and designers are small but critical cogs in that machine. Designers, even now the obedient servants of producers, are complicit in all the harmful and destructive implications of unbridled consumption. The names of designers can be found on all the plastic microparticles in our oceans. The modern practice of designing was born of the Industrial Revolution just two centuries ago. That is a very short period of time, just a blink of the eye in terms of history. Designs have been around for 250,000 years. Conscious modern designing has only been around for 200 years. Practitioners first described themselves as designers in the 1880s. And the first national associations of designers would only be established in the 20th century. Only in the 1960s did the first international associations of designers appear including ECOD and others participating in this event. These international associations were established by national European national associations of industrial, graphic, and interior designers, facing difficulties establishing professional respect within their own countries. They sought greater influence through international collaboration. These early attempts to institutionalize concepts of design professionalism proved to be very successful. And by the late 20th century, at least in certain Western countries, the status of design practitioners improved, but they still reflected the Victorian economic model. Designers continued to serve producers. Professional practice standards were couched in terms of traditional designer client relationships. In the triangular producer designer user relationship, producers remained dominant. Designers served producers. Producers determined what would be produced and merchandised with ever increasing consumption, regardless of impact the primary motivation in order to seek constantly increasing short-term corporate profit. The 21st century has seen a realization that the traditional economic model of unbridled consumption is not sustainable. In order to deal with the impacts of urbanization and industrialization, and more importantly, to ensure that the benefits of industrialization can be delivered equitably to all, the economic model has to evolve as human society has always evolved. Designers have a key role in that evolution. At ECOD, we realize that this means that there is an urgent need for designers to reconsider what it means to be a professional designer. The truth is that the design disciplines have yet to mature as a profession. 200 years is too short a period to accomplish that. Doctors have had more than 2,000 years to establish the tenets of professionalism, starting with the ancient Hippocratic Oath. With this collective professional community shared ethos, doctors have been able to establish respect and stature in society, not to mention the basis for financial security. Lawyers, too, have established a professional status for over many centuries, 
securing recognized public status and influence as officers of the court. EcoD feels that today's designers, especially considering the enormous impact we can affect, have to raise recognition of what it means to be a design professional. This is an effort that can only be achieved by collective design community action, supported by design education institutions. There must be a discussion about what it means to be a professional. What are the obligations? This discussion can only begin within the organized designer community between designers. Only when and if designer communities adopt professional attributes, standards of conduct, and professional language will designers be able to achieve public acceptance of the stature and respect required to have an impact. ECOD has adopted strategies to support increasing professionalism of designers as a core activity. In recent years, we have been active in the Design Declaration Summit effort. We are one of the six organizations composing the steering committee for that effort, along with our colleagues, IXDA and Cumulus, who are also participating. The Montreal Design Declaration, issued in 2017 and signed by 22 international bodies encompassing over 700 design entities from 90 countries, includes critical text describing the evolution of a designer professionalism. A few quotes from that document. Design has a critical role to create a world that is environmentally sustainable, economically viable, socially equitable, and culturally diverse. We maintain that each and every design decision, no matter how seemingly mundane, must be considered in terms of these four pillars of environmental sustainability, economic viability, social equity, and cultural diversity. Clearly, that requires an evolution in design practice and a public recognition of what designers do. The declaration goes on to say that designers too long the servants of producers better serve humanity as the ambassadors of the end users, the citizens of the world. These are powerful words. They call for a dramatic change in the status quo, especially in the traditional designer producer user relationship, giving designers a far more central role. Designers, while attending to the needs of individual users, must do so against a background of the public good. Doing so requires a new professional expertise and processes, but doing so also enhances the value of designers to all, and especially to producers. The Declaration declares that all people deserve to live in a well-designed world. Again, powerful words that reposition professional designers in the great scheme of things. I invite you to check out the design declaration effort at this website. Last year, as part of our effort to promote a new understanding of professionalism, ECOD extensively upgraded our professional code of conduct for designers, embracing the ideas I have presented today. The new code represents an important change of direction for our organization, focusing on the social, cultural, and environmental obligations of professional designers and our primary obligation to humanity and the planet, in addition to our traditional economic role and relationships with clients. To briefly summarize, the urge to design is a human attribute. Human history is a history of designs. The modern process of designing has global roots. Designing is universal. Current approaches to design practice have remained anchored in outmoded Victorian economic and cultural concepts. Economic models have to continue to evolve. Designers are complicit in the negative impacts of consumption and urbanization. Designers certainly have the capacity and therefore the obligation to ensure a better future. But to be part of the solution, designers must recognize that they are part of the problem. Designers, too long the servants of producers, better serve humanity as the ambassadors of the end users, our citizens, our communities. This requires a new approach to designer professionalism. We can only spread these messages through collective action, through professional communities and educational institutions. I thank you again for this opportunity to challenge the status quo through design. I hope I've been able to provide some new perspectives and to introduce ECOD. 
We look forward to significant collaboration for change as we have done in the past, as we are today, and as we will do with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That was uh, fantastic. It was very insightful and uh, a refreshing uh, thing to uh, think. So uh, you speak about uh, designers being uh, the, uh, the slaves of the producers. The, some of our audience uh, is asking, how do we change this approach in a team where uh, we have to look out for the business interests as well as the user's interests and Far, uh, far too long, uh, the designers have been trying to influence the user's mind to buy more. Right? So when that has been the end goal of uh, all our design solutions, how do we bring about this change? How do we bring about uh, this in a systemic way so that the teams could work together uh, going forward? Oh, it's a very good question, Pradyumna. I mean, we're talking about a shift in culture. We're talking about a shift in the, the model and the approach. But before we talk about how, I'll talk about the, the reminder of the amount of power that you do have as design industry. Remembering that if we have helped provide and shape the way the public thinks about consumption and access today, that means we have the power to reverse that. So it's less about the things and more about the processes and the expectations of what's out there. We need to shift the way we think. We need to help guide our communities to a place where they will benefit and not be encumbered with what we tell them they need. That starts with listening. So that goes back to the how. We have to start by listening. We have two ears and one mouth, but we rarely use them in that ratio. So if you're listening to twice as much as you're saying, you're already providing stronger, more cohesive and concentrated content. This is a great way to consider how we, as a, as a whole uh, a holistic approach to that shift needs to happen. And I'll also call upon that action. You know, we talk about the challenging status quo. If what you're describing status quo is, is that we are servants of producers and we can't change that, well, then I would argue against that because there are ways to reverse that. But every single thing that led to where we are today was based on decisions. And the more you are aware of, the more you listen, the more you know, and the more you stand for, then you will make stronger decisions when you're asked to do something that you may not believe in or may not be right. And we see that in advocacy groups and protests and uh, a concentrated effort to being better. And there's no better place than grassroots. And we see that at all levels. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think uh, we should all take away this fact that we need to make uh, a conscious effort to make uh, think about the implications and uh, how our decisions would lead to the sustainable future every time we're trying to design something. And uh, slowly and hopefully we entirely as a community and we'll be able to inflict this change in a bigger level. Agreed, agreed. It's on us, this is our responsibility. Yes. Thank you for uh, opening our minds to this and uh, giving us uh, a lot to think about. Uh, so it's a really uh, interesting uh, perspective and we would definitely like to follow up on that. Well, I welcome the conversation at any point. So you can find me on social media, uh, just Jonathan and the letter V after my name, if you spell it correctly, though, that's the thing. I think Pradyumna and I probably have the same problem with the spelling of our name. Even even my name here is spelled wrong. I'm going to right, 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 right here. This is this is wrong. <laughs> so it's, it's actually Jonathan. Okay. okay. I'm really sorry about that. Oh, don't worry. I get it all the time. Uh, I just uh, I put my social media handle in the chat. You can share that later or spread that around. And I welcome the conversation. Anybody, whether you whether you're the president of a company or whether you're a, a design student, let's talk about how we together are going to help change and challenge status quo. Okay, that was great. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, all the amazing. Uh, thoughts that you've given us. So uh, thank you everyone for joining in. So the next session would be starting and I request you all to go ahead and join there. So thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you everyone.